and deliver it. I got involved when government incentives to explore and develop natural gas in 2002 led to a company announcing that it would be drilling for natural gas on the top of the Grand Mesa, one of the largest flat-topped mountains in the world, and what my county and other counties consider our way. Within the last two years, we began to find large operations like this. I expect that this may be what the large energy operators will be proposing as natural gas leases are being sold and permitted in other regions of the country. This is a horizontal or directional drilling operation, and an investment like this would be about $2.5 million or more. It is here in the Rhone Plateau area where the latest technology is being tried out. It is supposed to be the most economically efficient way to produce gas. There are two drill rigs operating on this pad. Perhaps using a diamond drill or one of the newer bits that can cut drilling time in more than half. There are already 10 wells on this pad. See the 10 condensate tanks and the 10 pipes beside them called Christmas trees where the gas comes up from the ground. Those two double ride trailers are called a man camp. The workers often stay on the pads around the clock until the drilling ceases. We were told that there would eventually be 28 or 30 wells on this pad, and each well can be fracked 10 times. So easy math means that there could be 280 or 300 fracturing incidents done from this pad alone. Little. Here is a pad where drilling has ceased and the wells are now set up to produce gas perhaps for another 25 years. There are five wells on this pad. See the shadow to the left of the picture? That is one of the interesting looking contraptions called Christmas trees in the foreground. That is where the gas comes up from the ground from each well on the pad. To the right, you can see a solar panel that monitors the air temperature, and when it gets near freezing, it releases methanol or wood alcohol from that white tank in the gas, right into the gas coming out of the ground to prevent the pipes from freezing. Now, this is a very important safety factor. To the left, and to the back, you can see the separator unit with five glycol dehydrators. Now, as the gas comes up out of the ground, it is passed through a liquid in the separator column called ethylene glycol. When that ethylene glycol gets saturated with water, then it is heated, and the water is evaporated off to, the, to condense into the tanks that I will show you in a minute. Those noxious gases I mentioned, such as BTEX, and I'll mention them once more, benzene, ethylbenzene, toluene, and xylene, are allowed to vent off here. The orange arrow points at a pipe for flaring off those gases when the pressure gets high enough. And it is important to keep in mind that throughout all the processes you have seen so far, a great deal of natural gas is escaping and laundry will not work. This is the evaporation pit for the wash water from the refinery I just showed you. Note the cannon-like apparatus shooting the water into the air to assist evaporation. And note how the berm around this pond is beginning to erode. Pits like this service large numbers of wells, usually for one operator. Look closely and you should be able to see the red cab on the water truck unloading. A unit like this is another source for the release of nitrogen oxides, diesel, and VOCs. We could see no netting over these pits. This facility accepted truckloads of fluids from small developers and wildcatters from a radius of about 50 miles or more. No sampling or accounting for the chemicals in the incoming fluids took place at this unit or any other disposable units that we've looked into. When the pits dry out and become sludge, the residue is then land farmed. It is disked into the soil and supposed to be biodegradable. 
However, the biocides used during drilling and fracking would undoubtedly make the land incapable of producing much vegetation and certainly allow no biodegradation used in government publications. The last time this program was updated for Colorado alone, there were 246 products and 278 chemicals on our list. 93% of the 246 products had identifiable health effects. The other 7% represent the products for which we had limited information because the ingredients were listed as either proprietary or the names were too general or no ingredients were listed. And five of the products on, list, on this list had no ingredient information at all. Of those products that had health effects, 14% had one to three effects and 86% had four to 14 effects. And what surprised us was to find that 43% of the products on our list contain endocrine disruptors, chemicals that can interfere with the development of individuals before they are born and cause irreversible lifetime changes in their health and how they function later in life. Wildlife, starting at the lowest level in the food web, has proven to be sensitive to chemicals of this nature at ambient, or what we call, environmental concentrations. This is a picture of one of the corporate 400 bed man camps to house the gas field workers to make sure they have enough people to work around the clock. Men are being flown into Colorado from Canada to work for four weeks, 12 hours on and 12 hours off around the clock, and never leave the gas patch until they fly back to Canada for two weeks off and then back to Colorado again. Local laborers generally work 12-hour shifts as well, and men coming off their ships are exhausted. They complain of severe headaches and have other complaints matching some of what I mentioned earlier. More than that. The trees in our mountain forests in the west are the keepers of our water. They make it possible for us to have water year-round. Not only does ozone pose a direct threat to human health, it also poses a covert threat to our already marginal fresh water supply in the west by weakening the trees. But we know now that wherever natural gas operations are going to commence or increase, air pollution must be treated as seriously as water pollution. Downwind effects on agriculture and those living in rural areas must now be taken into consideration. From a life support system perspective in the West, we better find out how much of the water being taken from the Colorado River drainage basin to produce natural gas is being returned to the Colorado River system. Will this affect the Colorado River Compact commitments to the states downstream? This applies to all river drainages across the country, even in areas of high precipitation as in the east. As the size and intensity of natural gas extraction increased over the past decade, so have the numbers and the amounts of chemicals increased, putting air and water resources and more people at risk. And from a public health perspective, the time has come for full disclosure.